Thank you, Pastor Pat. And good morning, everyone, and happy Lord's Day to you. Uh, not only it is Lord's Day, which is great, but today also is another great day. It's a, a, uh, a Sister Payne, uh, Debbie Payne is celebrating her 39th birthday. And we wish you happy birthday, sister, and we love you. And then uh, I know here we go, everybody saying, no, pastor, you don't tell people's age. No, I had permission to say that. So uh, enjoy it. And then we pray and hope the Lord continue to bless you and uh, with all kind of blessing and that uh, his grace continue to flow and his uh, uh, health and all the good things before you this year. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to talk about the ministry of reconciliation. And our main text will come from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 21. Uh, we, uh, I am going to take my time to read that. And Jeff, if you didn't have 14, I give you 17, that's fine. But I'm going to read it. I'm going to take my time to read it. And I'm asking you, if that's all you can do, take time slowly and read this, it will be fine. Because everything else I'll be saying, really, it will, it's nothing. But what you will be reading, what we will be reading together, that will be the main thing. Okay? Uh, verse 14 says, For the love of Christ... Con constraineth us. And the word constraint is control. The love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ constrains us. Because we thus judge that if one die for all, then we're all dead. That's simple math. Okay, if you say 2 equal 1 plus 1, then 1 plus 1 equal 2. So if 1, you don't need to be smart to make this judgment right here. If 1 died for all, 1 died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. As simple as that. I don't care what language we speak. It is simple. One died for all, for those who are living are not living unto themselves anymore, but they are living for those, for him who died for you. Okay? And I shared that different time before. Uh, let's say, uh, we don't hope it's ever hap happened, but it's happened. Somebody come to shoot all of us here. And I know uh, I, we have many heroes here. Karen would be the first one to say, hey, kill me and leave everybody go. So, okay. The, that shooter would say, you, see, you, you mean it? Say, yes, let everybody go. And then they shoot Karen, and then we all go free. So are we just all going to take care of our business as nothing happened? Wouldn't you feel a moral obligation to reach out to her family, her grandchildren, and her dreams, whatever she had, and to see if we can live for her now because really she gave her life for us? That's exactly. Jesus died for you and for me. And this is uh, why Paul said we are crucified with Christ, right? Nevertheless, we live, but 
not us, but Christ lives in us. This passage should elevate the way we see our purpose on earth. Truly. If this passage doesn't mean much to you, you should really question your purpose for living. Verse 16, he continues to say, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth know him, we know more. We don't look at people now by their height, by their color, what they look, whether they're rich, whether they're poor. And Paul says, I used to see Jesus in different way. I used to see him really as an imposter. Now with a set, a new set of eyes, I see him differently. And he continued to say, therefore, if any man, any man, and obviously, you know, this word man means woman also. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things. All things. And Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, all means all. That's one word we don't have to argue about. Simple as that. When I look at people now, what I see is whether they are saved or they are lost. That's all I have to look for. Because if anyone be in Christ, it's a new creature. In, I, 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 my view is, is this, is this person in Christ or not? Is this person saved or not? Is this person a new creature or not? We look at people in terms of their souls. That's how we look at pe people. Or you don't look at people how bad they are, how good they are, how sinful or how holy they are. No, it's whether they are saved or not. The whole world can be broken down into two categories, old cre creation and new creation. That's all it is. You can be, you have different denominations. You can be part of a, of a denomination you think that believe the perfect truth. Still, it's still broken down, are you saved or not? Or you can be, uh, 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 it's personal. I mean, uh, just because you are wherever you are, or I, I, I heard it says you can be in a bakery, but that doesn't make you a bread, right? You can be in a garage, that doesn't make you a car. You can be in church, that doesn't make, make you a Christian. So that's how we cannot look at people different way. We treat church people one way because they are in church and we look at uh, other pe people, maybe not in our church, other denomination, in other way, because we just assume they are not Christian, but we need to look at them as whether they are lost or so, or saved. Okay? And Paul continued to say, verse 18, and all things are of God. All things. <laughs> God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. He is the one himself who reconciled us. And he has given to us the ministry 
of reconciliation. And this is what we'll be talking about. He has given to us, to you and to me, the word of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And this is important as we go in. He, he, he is not imputing their trespasses. He says he didn't come to condemn. And he hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ instead, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, for he hath made him, he, God, had made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. As you see, our title this morning is the Ministry of Reconciliation. Uh, I went and double-checked that word ministry. Ministry means service. Okay? Service. Service as serving table. That's all it is. It is service to non-believers. It is service to the lost world. Okay? So we are called to serve. Therefore, that's why we are serving. And remember, keep that in mind. We, the, giving the ministry of reconciliation is giving the task to serve those who are lost, to bring them to Christ, to bring them back to God. Keep that in mind. And the word reconciliation means the restoration of friendly relations. And when we say res restoration, that means it's something was whole at one point and broke down and and now it's going to be restored. So relationship, f friend friendship can be restored. And this word reconciliation, that's what it is. So the ministry of reconciliation is a personal workforce. It's personal because obviously before you do it, you yourself must be reconciled. And he reconciled us in Christ. We are all to be witness because we are all being lost and being restored. We relate to a personal experience that we have with the Lord, what we had done, what he has done for our soul. There is this move, movie that was a great movie and still is, The Passion of Christ, the last one. You know, it's really, it's, I don't, regardless how many times I watch it, there, there are a couple clips in it where I cannot watch. It's really hard. And the one is after they beat Jesus up really bad and blood was all over. And that lady came to sweep the floor. And she was sweeping the floor. And then they're playing what sh what's going on in her mind. She's reminding herself the scene where she was about to be uh, stoned and Jesus was there for her. And then she's doing it and then... And then you, you should be thinking about yourself, where you've been, where the Lord took you from, and, and how bad you are that you don't think about it every day. 
And then there is this uh, story where Jesus uh, was, I think, at Simon's place for, for di- dinner when that woman came and, you know, wash her, his feet and, and, and put perfume and expensive thing on him and dry his feet with her hair. And then uh, uh, Jesus knew what was going on in, in Simon's uh, uh, head, heart. And he gave him the story about, hey, uh, you know, uh, more. And the, the lesson of the story was the more was forgiven unto her, the more she loves. Sometimes you see people are going crazy for Jesus. It's because they remember what Jesus did, has done for them. So if you and I can get to the attitude where we go back and remember where we come from, who we really are and what Jesus has done for us, we would be excited to go tell people about him. And I can go on and on, and I'm not going to, but the, the Samaritan lady, lady, she has to go back to everyone to say, come see a man who told me everything. Everything. And we're going to break it down uh, this morning, talking about reconciliation with God, reconciliation with men, and us being uh, ambassadors. Uh, for for Christ. Reconciliation with God. God himself reconciled himself with with us. So uh, he didn't wait for us to come to him. Even though man is responsible for the barrier between man and God, but God didn't wait for man to come. God came. And the word of reconciliation and what he, he, he come with, he come to say, hey, I am willing to do whatever it takes to get our relations back. And what he did, he took the form of a man, right? And he came, he died for us. And then this is Jesus Christ. And this is all the word of reconciliation is about. Telling people that from the Garden of Eden, men disobeyed God. From that point on, there were men were separated with God. And now God himself comes on the form of a man uh, called Jesus. He manifested himself like that. And all you have to do is accept Jesus as the sacrifice for your sin. Because nothing you can do, nothing you can say, if whatever you do will not bring you back to God. You can only come to God through Jesus Christ. That's all it is. Anything else you add or remove doesn't do it. That's all the gospel is about. Man sins against God, but God made the advance to fix the relationship. The Bible says he came to seek and save those who are lost. He is the author of reconciliation. Our job is about sin and forgiveness. That's all it is. Let people know they are sinners and then let them know there is forgiveness. That's all it is. You see the simplicity that is in Christ? That Paul said he was afraid that the devil, the same way the devil seduced Eve, that the devil wouldn't seduce us. And that's what happened. We mix the gospel with so many other things that we're not doing the job we are called to do. Everyone is a sinner by nature or by action. By birth, we are alienated from God. 
we are enemies, but with the ministry of reconciliation, enemies can become friends. And you and I, we are the bridge, the mediators. We are the sent one to tell people, come, come. The Lord is ready to make peace with you. And it's not going to go back to what you've done. It's not going to go over and then we have to discuss this. No. Just come and accept the sacrifice and that's, that's it. Obviously, we just read, you will be in Christ. All things will be passed away and all things are become new. Now, the Bible says we are the ambassadors, the sent. I don't think we need to go too much about what an ambassador is. It's really the same thing then and now. Being an ambassador, though, means you have a good reputation, being a witness. You know, when you go to court, the, the lawyer will try to dig to see how you a a witness they can trust. So you cannot fake it as a Christian and then be an ambassador. You have to be the real thing, you know. <laughs> We're talking about the real thing, somebody who really believes from the heart uh, 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 and then truly striving to live for Christ, okay? Uh, but as ambassadors, we are exposed to different traditions, different cultures and different lifestyles. Yeah. When you send an American somewhere else, they are going to expose to different things from what they grew up with. Oh, there is so much about this world we are in, <laughs> in which we are ambassadors that we that are countercultural to us. Many things. And, and it's so bad that we even tend to, to hate the world when the Bible says God so loved the world. He so loved the world, he even gave his, he even sent his only begotten son for it. And us, we, are, we so hate the world. And then we do actually confuse the scripture where it says, love not the world, whether the things that, that is in the world, there are two different words. We're talking about people. God so love man. But as ambassadors, we tend not to like him. They're so sinful, you know? And Jesus died for them while they are in sin. But us, no, we want them to clean up before we can approach them. Why we, don't, uh, we feel like that? Because our citizenship is in heaven. We are alien and stranger, stranger of this world. We do not like the way the world thinks. We do not like the way the world acts. We do not endorse the things they endorse. We do not like the things they push on us. We don't. And we do everything we can to protect ourselves from, from, from it. Everything. We try to be separated. Doesn't the Bible say there's no fellowship with light and dark, darkness? There is no communion between us. We know that. But yet, we are here because we have been mandated to proclaim the message of reconciliation. And we have to be here for that. After that, the Lord could just save us and call us home. We are not on earth because of because there is a mission so don't you think do you think it's a good idea we should leave civilization and build 
monasteries and live our lives so be separated? Is that the way you think it should be? No. But at the same time, we tend to keep in mind in our mind that uh, we are on earth to change the culture, to change it. Remember what Jesus said, we are fishers of men, fishers of men. A fisherman doesn't go to the ocean to clean it, does he? Go to catch fish. Whatever mess that is in it, sorry, it's a mess and not much you can do. It's so vast, there is not much you can do. Catch your fishes. That's remember when you see things are passing up and going up, don't get lost because keep your eyes on the fishes. That's what you ought to do. As much as we want to change the world, it's not our mandate. That's not why we are sent to the world to do. When you send an American ambassador to any part part of the world, they are not mandated to make the world more American. That's not it. Now, I can tell you, back in our minds as Americans, we want the whole world to be American. We know that. But officially, your mandate cannot go to say, well, we want you to adopt our democracy just the way we want it and blah, blah, blah. We have tried. We have tried to turn everything around. We cannot. And we will not be able to. You have to go and see, learn people's culture and learn their lifestyle and, and do what you come to do. But you cannot come and you will be frustrated because you cannot do it. You will be sidetracked like we, we know it. We see it here. And unfortunately, even from our own ministry, we see we get uh, sidetracked on, on conservatism versus liberalism. It's not our mandate. And some, something even, you may be surprised. We're not even, the concern is not even your sickness, your marriage, your financial situation, your problem. No, that's not even the mandate. That's not even it. Now, in a package, they'll come, but first thing first. Doesn't Jesus himself say how, how good it is for a man to earn the whole world and lose his soul? The saving of soul is the message, the mandate number one. If we are ambassadors, we better be clear on the message. We are sent. We better make sure we know what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to say, because it is not our message. We are just messengers. That's all we are. I do not wish that our ministry be driven by politics, even though we do. We do do politics. And again, we are not sent to clean the swamp. We are sent to catch fish. We do not want to be known as a ministry, as Democrats, as Republican ministry. They can be Democrat in the ministry, Republican in the ministry, but it should not be Oh, oh, Christian fellowship? Oh, that's Democrats' ministry. That's Republicans' ministry. No, it doesn't work like that. We have want to be known as the ministry of reconciliation. That's what we do. Okay? We need to make sure we know what the message is. And the message is the gospel. The gospel is nothing more than the good news 
we can be reconciled to God and God is wide open. He is waiting for us. Now, with this being said, I hope you, you are ready to go now. You're ready to say, yes, I have that ministry. I'm going to do it. I'm ready for mission. I understand what the message is. Before you say that, I want you to listen to this. First of all, whether you want or not, the Bible says he has chosen you, right? You haven't chosen him. <laughs> and he has chosen you that you shall go, you should go and bring forth fruit. And Paul says, woe unto me if I don't do it. So we really don't have a choice. Woe unto me. <laughs> there is a, a brother, jo, jo, Jonah, who was sent, and you know how it happened. He didn't want to go because they know these people thought, you know, but God forced him to, to go. You, you know what happened. So whether we want or not, we really are tag are we. We are it, right? There is our brother Moses. He was ready to go, actually, whether he wanted or not. God says, you go. Every excuse he gave, God find an answer for him, and he had to go. So let's say you and I listening to this, we know our mission now, we're going. But as Moses was on his way, God tried to kill him. And when I read that, I was confused. I said, no, that must be my French Bible. I read it in English. It makes the same sense. God wanted to kill Moses. As that doesn't make sense. God wanted to kill him because he was going to for judgment. But he himself, his, ha his house wasn't clean. His sons were not circumcised. But his wife was there. You know the story. His wife recognized that before God just done away with him and the wife circumcised them and then God let him go. Because the Bible says the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it is first begin at us, it's first begin at us. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So there is this, uh, those two words, moat and beam. Uh, I'm, I'm not, English is not my first language, so I had to look for them to see if it means the same in French. Mot is a tiny piece of substance. <laughs> That's what it says. It's a tiny piece of substance. But mot, it's huge. Jesus told his disciples, Why beholdest thou the mot? That is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. And how will thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shall thou see clearly to cast out the mud out of thy brother's eyes. To see a tiny thing, you need good sight, right? You need good eyes. But if you have a big beam, how can you see that? You do want to help your brother, right? You want to help your sister, right? But in order to see the little things in your brother's sister's eyes, it's, it's a good advice that you clean your own eyes. 
Now, I see like Jesus doesn't seem to have a problem with having a beam or having a, a moat. All he cares about if you... One moment. Okay. <laughs> All he cares about is that you recognize that you have a beam. It's not a question you have a beam or you're, you're no good. No. He just, because remember, to be reconciled, it takes patience and wisdom and endurance, right? So you're not going to want to be reconciled and then all you're going to show is pointing out beams. But Jesus said you need to recognize it. And recognize it so you can take it out so you can help somebody else. Therefore, Matthew 5, 23, 26. If you bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother ought, hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. You and I must go and do likewise. If you want to embrace this ministry of reconciliation and you are serious about it, look around you in your family. Brothers, sisters, mom and dad, cousins, niece, nephews, to see if there isn't anybody you need to reconcile with. And he says, if somebody has something against you, or if somebody did something to you. And let me tell you what, I have a, a sister that... Uh, she believes I offended her or I did something that I don't deserve forgiveness. And uh, she, that's a few years ago. When I say a few years ago, if you, it's around when Pat and Cedric went to, to Florida. So she sent me a text. She said, act like she never existed. No Actually, she, in her will, she says she's going to request that I don't take part in her funeral or anything. And uh, so I tried to reach out, and she was serious about it. And from that time on, and I made peace with myself. I said, okay, I am clear. But I have another sister who kept on telling me, no, you have to call her. You have to. I said, she has nothing to do with me. And, and I am open. I let her know I'm wide open whenever she was. And my sister kept on saying, no, you have to. You have to. So I said, no, just let her know I am open. While I was preparing this message, <laughs> I said, you know what? I, I have to listen to my sister and call my sister. I really felt it was, I was fine because I said, no, I let her know I am open for her, I'll wait for her. And I took it upon myself that I have to call her. And if she doesn't an an answer, that's fine, but I will continue to do it. You have to do that. Friends, co-workers. You have boss, you have people at work, or whatever it is. You have to start there if you want to go and practice this ministry of reconciliation. And who knows? This is where it starts. It may start because of this act. Your brother, your sisters, your family come to know Jesus. And they come to say, wow, that's different. That's not the so-and-so I know. And then you can have the opportunity to say, well, it's because of Jesus. I'll have to tell my sister if she gives me the opportunity. She will know. And she probably be saying, man, I, now let me tell you, no, I do know 
she wants our relationship to be restored. But because it was so dramatic because she did it, she's embarrassed to call. And me, I said, I say, I'm not calling either. I'll wait for her to, you know. It doesn't work like that. God didn't wait for us to come to him. He came to us. That being said, in the name of Christian Fellowship Church Ministries International, I make a plea for reconciliation with anyone who once was part of us and who left this ministry for one reason or another. If an individual offended you, may it be between you and that individual. But if the offense was Christian Fellowship Ministry International, we want reconciliation. Here it is. This is our ministry. I, if I have to, to do it and I know someone is somewhere, I have to make the move, I'll make it. That doesn't mean you necessarily have to come back and be in church. But the way our ministry works right now, you can be part of the ministry wherever you are, and we can be friends in ministry. But we have to be reconciled because God called for it. This is my plea for you. Christian Fellowship fam family, and this is my plea for you out there. Our doors are open because the Lord demands it, that we be reconciled, and he has given us the word of reconciliation. May it be so for the glory of God. God bless you.